my life to you, I give shout from the inside out. Welcome to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Moulter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today. Sit tight, get your Bible, and get ready to get in the Word with us as we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book through the Word of God. Well, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Joshua chapter 23. The title of our study is Joshua's Farewell Address. As we get nearer the finish line of the book of Joshua, we're not quite there yet. There'll be one more chapter. Um, we see that Joshua gives um, this farewell speech or address, if you will. And you might kind of think, well, maybe this is like his retirement speech, right? Kind of what Moses did before he passed the baton. Um, but we don't quite see that from Joshua. We see some final exhortations, some final encouragements uh, in the Lord. And so uh, this is a, kind of his final reminder to Israel, and we'll see there's a couple more words he adds in the next chapter. We'll look at that next week. Um, but we'll see the importance of what he's communicating to the leaders and to uh, the nation of Israel as a whole. And my hope is that we can glean from this, that we can see there's application that applies to us, and that it would be encouraging our hearts as well. So with that, let's take a look at the first five verses here. We'll see this encouragement to obey the word of God. So picking up here in Joshua chapter 23, verse 1. Now it came to pass a long time after the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua was old and advanced in age. And Joshua called for all Israel, for their elders, for the heads of their judges and for the officers and said to them, I'm old and advanced in age. You have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who has fought for you. See, I have divided to you by lot these nations that remain, to be an inheritance for your tribes from the Jordan, with all the nations that I have cut off as far as the great sea westward. And the Lord your God will expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight. So you shall possess their land as the Lord your God promised you. We'll pause there. One of the first things that jumped out to me as I was reading this was that God gave them rest. And it probably seemed like a long time. Uh, some commentators said that from this point that uh, they begin coming towards the promised land and, and moving through it to where they're at now, it would probably been about 20 years. And so there was the importance of resting from the wandering in the wilderness, resting in the land, and for me, it's a, it's a reminder that this is a picture of what we have in Jesus Christ. That we have rest in Jesus from a life of wandering in the wilderness. And uh, wandering in a life without meaning and purpose, right? We have life found in Jesus Christ. And so God is our good shepherd. He takes good care of us knowing uh, that he's leading us all ultimately to our real home that he's prepared for us in advance in heaven. And just a side note, if God created this whole world in six days, it's pretty remarkable, right? You see the, the fall leaves changing color. That's pretty neat. Imagine what heaven's going to look like. He's been up there for thousands of years getting that ready for us. It's going to be magnificent, mind-blowing, right? So a lot to look forward to of being with our Lord and Savior in heaven forever. We also see here, it mentions that Joshua was old and advanced in age. God says that, and then Joshua repeats it. Obviously, it's true. And so he gathers the leaders of Israel together and tells them that. Um, and Judges uh, 2.8 says, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. So he's, he's up there in age, right? He's advanced in years, as the Bible says. So probably didn't have a loud, booming voice as he once did. Um, so he's communicating this to the leaders of the nation, so then they can communicate that to uh, the rest of the people. And we see here also in verse 3, it says that they have seen what God has done, how he led them out of Egypt through the wilderness, 
Right? They cross the Red Sea, they cross the Jordan River, how he conquered the enemy there at Jericho and Ai, and how God has been faithful to be with them and lead them to that promised land. And so too, we can look back and we can see God has been faithful in our lives. The hardships that we've gone through, the, uh, the messes that we've made and how God's been with us and walked with us through those circumstances. And it should give us confidence no, knowing no matter what else we face in life, he'll be there with us. He will walk through those things with us. We can count on our Lord. And he's faithful to his word. So, God led us out of our own wilderness, right? He's leading us while on earth, and we can continue to put our trust in him. Well, we also see here under Joshua's leadership that the army of Israel took control of the land, but it was still up to each individual tribe to fully possess the land that was given unto them. And it's interesting here, God says, the land is yours. In essence, God's giving them that land. The truth is, whole earth belongs to God, right? All the land belongs to God. He's called us to be stewards of it. And that should encourage us that we should be good caretakers of this planet, good caretakers of the property we have and, and the natural resources around us, doing what we can, right? We want to see if the Lord tarries our kids and grandkids, be able to enjoy those, those things around us. Um, and so we see that this message here that um, God gave them this land to manage, right? To be good stewards of. And if you get the chance to go to Israel, you'll see the magnificent job they've done. How they've taken some of these places and it's just, it's beautiful. The things that they can grow there. I mean, they've got like avocados and then they've got pineapple and they've got bananas and you're like, oranges. What else do you have? What don't you have? Would probably be the best question to ask. It's, it's amazing. Um, and so it's, it's a reminder of what God wants to do in our lives as well as we seek after him, that he can guide us. And spiritually, in the same way, God gives every believer an inheritance in him. In Acts chapter 20, verse 32, Paul the apostle said, And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So God has called us to do our part in abiding in him and growing in our faith. But he's also doing a work in and through our hearts and through our lives. And, uh, and he wants to build us up because our inheritance is in him, right? But at the same time, we need to realize if we're going to be bearing spiritual fruit, we got to abide in him, right? We got to follow him. We got to walk with him day in and day out. And uh, that's what we're going to see next, this encouragement to hold fast to God. And we'll see that here in verse 6, and we'll go through verse 11. Therefore, be very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left, and lest you go among these nations, these who remain among you. You shall not make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them nor bow down to them, but you shall hold fast to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out from before you great and strong nations. But as for you, no one has been able to stand against you to this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised you. Therefore, take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God. We'll pause there. We see the instruction here to follow God, to put him first and foremost in our lives. But at the same time, we need to realize following God is not for the faint of heart. Jesus often talked about counting the cost and following him. And when there were great multitudes of crowds, which sure every pastor would like, right? What did Jesus do? He began to speak the truth. And the crowds would kind of get a little smaller, but he'd get the authentic disciples, those that understood what it meant to be following Jesus as the Messiah. And so I think part of this 
mindset of counting the cost is something many people maybe, I would say, don't do in America. On the other parts of, of the planet Earth, around the world, um, they count the costs. They're realizing what it's going to mean if I put my faith in Jesus and declare I'm a follower of him, my family is going to excommunicate me. They don't want anything to do with me. I might lose my job. I might lose my house. My community is going to look at me like an outcast. Right? And so they're realizing, is this worth it? But if this is true, it's worth it. And so they, they consider that cost. And, and, and what they find afterwards is they find a whole new family, a Christian family that loves them, that gets it, that is encouraging with them and is walking with them through uh, this new life that they have in Christ Jesus. So we need to have that same mindset, right? That we need to count the cost in following Christ. And the reality is what we get, a part of that in following Christ is so much better than all the, the bad baggage we let go of. When we let Christ change our hearts and cleanse us, the joy that we get in knowing the Lord is so much better. So we see that Israel was told to hold fast to the Lord, to not turn aside to it from the right hand or to the left. Pastor David Guzek said, Satan doesn't care which extreme he pushes us towards, either legalism or licentiousness among God's people pleases Satan. And so often the enemy will push us towards one of those extremes. Legalism is where you're trying to keep a legal list of do's and don'ts, rules, right? I am a really good Christian because I do this, this, and this, and I don't do that, that, and that. No, <laughs> you're not going to get any more holy. Right? You need to abide in Christ to follow him. Right? And then other people say, well, I can do whatever I want. Licentiousness. I've got a license to sin. I can ask God to forgive me later on. I'm God's child. Well, you better go to read Romans. <laughs> Paul says, God forbid that I should do that. That I should have that mindset that I can go sin and live as the world and afterwards ask God to forgive me. No, I mean, you need to make sure you're checking your heart, right? And so we see those two extremes that the enemy will try and get people to. And, uh, and so we need to be cautious. And Joshua tells Israel not to even make mention of these false gods of the Canaanites. And so instead of learning all about those false gods, they're to hold fast to the Lord their God. And the Canaanites, they were heavy, heavy on idolatry. They had a, a lot of these strange uh, gods that they served. One of their most, I'd say probably uh, known one was Baal. And uh, we'll see, uh, you've probably read it when you get to Elijah and the showdown on Mount Carmel with this false god. Uh, Baal was considered the, the god of the weather. And yet they can't make fire come down and, and they can't have any rain on the land. And God shows up and shows who's boss, right? As he does, God's in control. He's in control of the weather. And, uh, and so Israel repents and returns back to the Lord in that, in that short season. But we see that this is a test for Israel, not to follow the customs of idolatry. And I was thinking about that, and I thought, well, what about us? You see, idols aren't just something that we fashion with wood or stone that we make with our hands. Idols can be anything, anything that we put in the place of God. If God's not on the throne of our heart when we put something else there that's more important than, any, than anything else other than God, that, that's an idol. Right? We're consumed by this thing. Right? And so we have to be very cautious. Again, it's not a bad or evil thing to have hobbies and those kind of things, um, but we got to be cautious we don't make that an idol. Right? We can enjoy it as the Lord gives us the freedom to, but we want to be cautious um, but we don't put anything in the place of God. And there are many false gods in the world today that people trust in. But we're not called to become experts in all those things. We're called to become an expert in the truth. We're called to be an expert of Jesus Christ, to know him. And as I look at the culture around us, the, this woke culture, man, it is seeking after what feels good. It doesn't really care about what is true. And it saddens me to see these woke churches seeking after popularity. And, uh, and most go along with it. Why? Just to get along. They don't want confrontation. They don't want pushback. And so 
you want us to do this? Fine, we'll just go along with it. And, and they're concerned about pleasing the masses, pleasing people rather than pleasing the Lord. And, and then you see, well, Christians, they're seeking after the acceptance of these other groups, right? And uh, they're trying to become more popular in that, and they're really trying to seek this spiritual experience. But it's apart from what Christ has said in his word. And so again, we're to, we're to count the cost. As this world gets more and more crazy, evil becomes good and good becomes evil, um, we're going to be looking a little bit different than the world. And that's, that's okay. That's a good thing. God never called us to be popular anyways. I hope you know that. Um, Jesus wasn't always popular among the people of his day. Some people loved him and other people wanted to kill him. And so we have to realize that as his followers, there are going to be Christians that, that love, that were united in Christ, and there's going to be people that say, you're crazy, you're one of those Jesus freaks, man. You've gone off the deep end. You drank the Kool-Aid, right? And we're going to say, man, taste and see the Lord is good. Come and join us, right? You need to find out that God loves you, and he can change your heart and change your life as well. And so we see Israel was told to abide in the Lord. And they saw God do great things through them. As they continued to abide, they would be able to see great things as God would fight on their behalf. And I love this, what it says here in verse 10, that one man of you shall chase a thousand for the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised. And this was fulfilled multiple times in the Bible. I'm just going to give you three, the top three that popped in my mind this week as I was preparing uh, the first one is in Judges 15:15. 15, 15. It talks about Samson, all right, the strong guy who uh, God uh, used him mightily, and he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, put his hand, and he took it, and he struck a thousand men with it. Uh, the second one that came to my mind was Judges 7, about Gideon and his 300 men. And uh, they come near the enemy at night, and they break the jar. And then their left hand, they hold a torch, and the right hand, they have trumpets to blow. And they cry out, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And the, the enemy of the Midianites flee, right? They're panic and they run. And the third example that came to my mind was 1 Samuel 14. When we see Jonathan, uh, the son of King Saul. He decided to raid a, Philist, a Philistine outpost. And he told his armor bearer in 1 Samuel 14, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. And indeed, the Lord was with Jonathan and his companion, and they went towards the Philistine camp, and they struck down about 20 of them. And then God sent a panic into the enemy camp, along with the earthquake, and the enemy fled. Right? So we see this time and time again. There's other examples where God sends an angel and wipes out a whole army and all kinds of stuff, where hail comes down and destroys armies. Read it yourself, you'll find out. There are a lot of examples where God fights for his people. And we need to realize the same is true for us, right? We don't have a physical battle that we're fighting. It's a spiritual battle. And God is fighting that spiritual battle. We may not see that spiritual realm, but God is there. He's working on our behalf. and He's working on those lives around us of our loved ones who need to surrender their life to Jesus Christ. Right? He's doing what he can to open their eyes to the truth, to help them see his love for them. So what about us? Romans 8.31 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? You see, we need to remember the battle belongs to the Lord. Right? We're not fighting these battles on our own. Right? God's in control. And Ephesians 6 tells us there's spiritual weapons for us that God has already provided and that we can use those. Right? And uh, so we see that God is able to be with us in those battles. And maybe you feel all alone in the midst of standing up for righteousness and for truth, but you need to remember God wins. He's with you. And if you read the book of Revelation, you'll see what comes to pass, right? God always wins his battles. He never loses. And so we see God's in control of everything. Everything's going to work out. Everything's going to be okay in the end. And we realize heaven's getting closer each day, right? So Joshua reminds them to love the Lord from the heart. And there are many things both within us and without side of us that will try and draw us away from the Lord. 
away from that love, but we need to make that decision to love the Lord our God. Even if the feelings don't come immediately, we need to know we need to place our trust in him. And it's been said before, it's hard to love someone if you don't know them, right? If you're married here, you know your spouse pretty well. Um, you got to court them, you learned about them, you fell more in love with them, right? The same is true with the Lord is that it's hard to trust someone you don't really know. The more we read the scriptures, the more we realize his character and his goodness, the more we can realize we can trust him, we can open up with what we're facing and he can help us and walk us through those circumstances. So I think the more we, we read the word, the more we realize he loves us and a faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we can see that um, we need to hold fast to God. And if you um, don't understand the picture there, I, th- I thought this was interesting, in the New Testament it talks about this, how we're to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you were going to jump out of an airplane and someone gave you a parachute, would you just kind of loosely hold on to it or would you hold fast to that parachute? You're going to hold fast to that thing, right? That's that's what you're holding on to as you're, hopefully it opens, right, as you're jumping out of an airplane. And that's the picture of what we need in Christ. We need to hold fast to Jesus, to cling to him, not just through the hard times of life, but every day. We need to cling to Jesus to realize he's the author and the finisher of our faith and that we can trust him with our lives. Now, if we don't hold on to the Lord, If we don't heed God's word, we'll find out what happens next if you want to ignore uh, those exhortations. And we'll see that warning here in verse 12 through the end of the chapter. He says here in Joshua chapter 23, verse 12, or else, if indeed you do go back and you cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you and make marriages with them and go into them and they to you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you and scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. And then Joshua says here in verse 14, Behold this day I am going the way of all the earth. And you know in all your hearts and all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. Therefore it shall come to pass that as all the good things has come upon you which the Lord your God promised you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the harmful things until he's destroyed you from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. When you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods and bowed down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and you shall perish quickly from the good land which he has given you. We see this warning. If they do not listen to God, or what's already been said through Moses, or through the Lord, or now we see through Joshua, this warning of what will come. That is, if they do not separate themselves from these ungodly influences, we see that that will become to them a snare and a trap, a whip for their backs, thorny brambles in the eyes, and they will vanish from the good land. You see, temptation, if it's not dealt with, will become a trap to us. And if we don't remove ourselves from those influences, they'll become a thorn in our side. You see, it's like how as parents, if you're your parent or grandparent, you tell your children not to do something, what happens? They want to do it, right? Don't put your hand on the stove. What do you find? Well, how close can I get? You know, where is it going to start hurting, right? And, and yet we tell them that because we're concerned about them. We don't want them to get hurt. Right? We tell them what to do, and we also tell them what not to do because we know what's best for our kids, right? 
beyond what you hear the media or the government says, they know what's best for kids. You know what's best for your kids. God knows what's best for your kids. And, and the, the reality is, we have to realize this, as God's kids, God knows what's best for us. When he tells us to do something or not do something, we should stop and realize, you know what, God, you're a lot smarter than I am. I'm gonna trust you know what you're saying. And I should listen to you and, and consider your way way above my ways. And, and so we see that um, God is reminding them here that they need to hear him out because God knows what way is best for them and God knows what way is best for us. And so it made me consider uh, this week as I was thinking about this, who directs and influences our life? Are we looking to others? Are we looking to athletes or musicians or politicians or movie stars for inspiration? Are we looking to social media or TV or the internet or AI for direction? Or are we looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? Right, to Jesus, our good shepherd who wants to lead us and guide us. This world is going to try and pull us away and say, I've got the answer. Or we can go to the Lord and to his word and say, no, God's got the answer. Right, this, this Bible that we have, this is truth. Right, it doesn't matter how quick AI can write something. It doesn't mean it's true. Right, God's word is the truth. And we can turn to him and find the right answer, the biblical answer. So Joshua reminds them that they know in their hearts and their souls that God has not failed to keep his word, the promises and the blessings, but also the warnings and the curses. So this is a double-edged warning to Israel. God is faithful to his word. He will bless them. But if they wander away, he will also bring the punishment upon them and expel them from the land. The good news for us is that in the new covenant, in Jesus, we could no longer experience God's faithfulness to curse us because Jesus took the curse upon himself on the cross. See, he wore a crown of thorns and thorns from the very beginning were cursed, right, because of the sin of, of man. Also, in the Old Testament says, curses anyone who hangs on a tree. So Jesus took on like a double curse for us, right? He took on our sins. So all the cursing, all the punishment, and all the combination that we deserve was put upon Christ. That's why it says in Romans 8, 1, therefore that there's no condemnation for those from Christ Jesus, right? He's took all that wrath, all that judgment that we deserve. Yet at the same time, we need to realize that as a loving father, God is faithful to correct us. And Hebrews 12 says, uh, Hebrews 12, 7 says that, that God is faithful to correct us as a loving parent would correct their children, right? So he will convict us of our sin and call us out from time to time and you'll get that tap on your heart or a check in your spirit that that probably wasn't the best thing to do. You need to go to that person and apologize or you need to make things right. And, and God will lead us to do that, right? And, and, it's a correction, right? Because he loves us. He wants to see restoration take place. And if we ignore that, we experience a lack of blessing as we do not abide in Christ Jesus. So Israel's given this warning also that if they marry into these pagan nations around them, what's going to happen? We see this in the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians 6.14, it says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So it's always been contrary to God's will for believers to marry unbelievers. Amos 3, 3 says, Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? So how do we respond to God's word? Do we say, well, God, that's great, but I'm the exception. I really love this person. We're going to make it work. Our marriage or this relationship is going to just blossom on love. God knows what's best. Right? The whole idea of this missionary dating thing doesn't work out very well. And so we see that if someone is, is uh, in a relationship with an unbeliever, it's essentially uniting opposites. It's going to make for a difficult relationship. 
And I would say also know that if that marriage relationship, in that relationship, if marriage is not the end goal, then you're setting yourself up for breaking up or later on divorce, right? Marriage should be uh, the purpose of being in that relationship. Now, if you're married to an unbeliever, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, verse 12 through 14 says, If a man has a wife who's not a believer, she's willing to live with them, he must not divorce her. If a woman has a husband who's not a believer, he's willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. So if you're a Christian and you're married to someone who's not a Christian, yes, you're in a difficult situation, but the Lord can still work in the middle of that situation. God can use you to be a light to your unbelieving spouse. You're going to need to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to enable you to do that, to live a life showing the love and the light of Christ. And you're going to need God's transforming power to change your heart and produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And also, you're going to want to be praying for your spouse who doesn't know the Lord, that God would soften their heart and open their eyes to the truth. Now, if you're married or you're unmarried, the best thing you can do right now is to focus on your relationship with God. Don't try and change the other person. Be the person that Jesus wants you to be. Be the person that is all about Christ, growing in your relationship with him. And if you're married, do the same thing, because the best thing you can do if you're in a married relationship is you come closer to the Lord, your spouse comes closer to the Lord, and in that process you find you're both coming closer together. Right? It's like this pyramid. Right? The husband's drawing closer to Christ, the wife's drawing closer to Christ, and in that process, they're both coming closer together as well. They have unity in the Lord. And uh, Jesus is that third strand of the cord, right? Not easily broken. And I would also add this, keep yourself pure. The culture today has no boundaries, no self-control, right? We need to live different than the culture. Lives is unto the Lord. Purity is a good thing, right? And so we want to live a life not following the culture, even though the culture says it's okay. Well, God says it's not okay. And he knows what's best for me. I'm going to listen to the Lord. And you'll find God does know what's best for us. And you'll receive those blessings as you follow him. So in closing, God is faithful to love us. He's faithful to forgive us. He's also faithful to guide us. And he's faithful to correct us. He's faithful to tell us the truth as recorded in the scriptures. And that truth is you must be born again. John chapter 3 talks about this, how we must have this spiritual birth. Right? We need to be born again. We've had a physical birth. right? We're all here physically. Some of you may be asleep. I don't know. But we need to have a spiritual birth. right? Where we're then in tune with God. God's spirit comes and dwells within us. And we begin to realize that we can have fellowship with the creator, right? And, and you need to realize that Israel began to believe they were saved because of their heritage, the faith of their ancestors. And yet, that was the furthest thing from the truth. They individually had to put their trust in Jesus Christ. And if you grew up in a Christian home or you're growing up in a Christian home, you are blessed, but you need to know you're not saved because of the faith of your parents or your grandparents. God has no grandchildren, only children. You gotta individually put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. You need to have a spiritual birth to become born again, right? Repent of your sins and put your faith and trust in Christ alone. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for these reminders of your faithfulness to love us, Lord, that you are with us no matter what we face. Lord, that we can be encouraged to obey your word, that we can be encouraged to hold fast to you. And Lord, to know that if we don't, that there will be a season of correction. Lord, help us not put that last part to the test. Help us not to be a prodigal and wander, but to stay close to you. Help us, Lord, to be a light to those around us. 
Help us, Lord, to, to point people to you and that they would see a change in our life or that we can declare with our words but also with our life the transforming power of your grace and of this good news that we can share with others. And Lord, we pray if there be anyone here this morning who's yet to make that decision to repent of their sins and put their faith and trust in you, God, we ask that today would be their day of salvation. And as every Christian here is praying, if you're here this morning and say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me, I need to get right with God. I'm not 100% confident that if I died today, I'd be in heaven. I need that assurance to know that my sins have been fully paid for and that I'm a child of God. And if that's you this morning and you're ready to make that decision, whether you're here in person or watching the live stream online or listening to this message later on, and you're ready to make that decision to put your trust in Christ, I simply want to lead you in a prayer where you make the decision to turn from your sins and put your trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. And if you're ready to do this, I want to encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and mean it in your heart. And God, I realize that I am a sinner and that my sin separates me from you. And God, I realize that you love me, that Jesus, you died on the cross for my sins, that you were buried and rose from the grave. God, I ask that you'd forgive me of all my sins, that you'd wash me clean, and that you'd come into my heart and my life to be my Savior and my Lord. I ask God that you'd help me from this day forward to follow you, and that I may do your will God, I thank you for knowing me. I thank you for loving me. I thank you for being my Savior and my Lord. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look, if that was you and that was the first time you prayed to receive Christ or rededication, let me know. I'd love to encourage you, pray with you, give you a Bible if you don't have one. You've been listening to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Moulter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today as we study God's Word cover to cover, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Would you like to partner with us? Consider becoming a giver with us to support this ministry. Please visit ccfergusfalls.com slash giving. Find out more about this ministry and all of our ministries check out ccfergusfalls.com. May God bless you as you study his word with us and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Life to you I give shout from the inside out.